moves, holding fast to the promise of the truth that you were holding tighter still to me. Though the rock won't move and his word is strong, the rock won't move and his love can't be undone. The rock won't move and his word is strong, the rock won't move and his love can't be undone. The rock of our salvation. the rock that won't move. We're going to continue to sing about his love that always remains regardless of circumstances. So sing that with me. Higher than the mountains that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constantly the child
Matthew twenty-two twenty-nine. You err, for you do not know the power of God nor the scriptures. I learned that because of Colby Corso, my director at the BCM. And he's called it his life verse, because whenever we don't realize the power of God in the scriptures, we fail. But this song, if we really come to grips with that, if we really come to grips with the words that we just sang, then we'd realize that we are not enough, but He is. All the time, He is good. So dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that we surrender to You as Your Word is presented. May Your glory and Your power be presented to us today as well. May we never see any fault in you, in the blameless sacrifice, but in ourselves. May we come broken, and may we be filled and forgiven, because you never fail us. We praise you, Almighty God, for loving us amidst all of our error. May we hear you today and see you. In your name I pray, amen.
Good morning. Israelis say Boca Tov. Kind of sounds like broken toe, doesn't it? The only way I remembered it was their good morning it sounds like broken toe. It's Boca Tov or something. Good to be with you, good to be back. And uh, we are, 11 of us spent about nine days on our way and in um, Israel. Good to be back. Last Sunday, I was standing in the chilly Jordan. <laughs> I think that's, there's some song talked about the chilly Jordan being like death or something. It was pretty close to that. Uh, although we were there for a good reason, four of our group wanted to kind of renew their their heart to the Lord and baptized, being baptized in the Jordan. And it was 8 o'clock on Sunday morning, and it's still winter over there. So uh, it was a little chilly, but it was worth it. And uh, glad to get to do that. The day before, we had been on the Sea of Galilee. And in the morning, you, get, you, you arrange to take one of these little simulated fishing boats uh, out on the water and... Uh, it's a really special time. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is one place where they can't build a shrine, you know. It's just the water, and you just, it's just pristine, and it's, you just remember all the Bible stories you heard in your life about the Gal Sea of Galilee. And as we walked onto this boat, they were playing uh, Hillsong singing uh, Oceans. You call me out upon the water. Oh, my, that was, that was really neat. Find out that Whenever Hillsong wrote that song, they wrote it on that on this guy's boat, and uh, so it was really special to do that. We had a worship service out <coughs> out on the uh, Sea of Galilee, just singing songs and talking about where we were. And anyway, I'll there'll be other things that'll come up in the course of messages because so much of the Book of Acts, like we're in, it takes place in places that we were. The first day there, we went to Joppa, which is where. Peter was living um, when the Lord had to give him a little do-better lesson on uh, prejudice and bigotry. Um, and then he went and he heard from Cornelius and went to Caesarea. And, and then just so much of that, the book of Acts that we're in right now, that's kind of why I've been excited about this coming up because right in the middle of the book of Acts, get to make that trip. And so uh, appreciated uh, everybody taking care of things last week. Builder Bob was here talking about uh, the Lord and the Word and, and the Gideon ministry, which I think is such a great work. My dad was a Gideon. I, I learned of the Gideon work early in my life. And they've continued to do one thing, do it well, get the Bible in places. We were watching a movie recently, and in the movie this guy was sitting on a, the side of a motel room bed and pulled the drawer out, and there was that Gideon Bible. And I thought, you know, that's just, it's just it comes up in all kinds of places. If you weren't here last week and didn't get a chance to uh, contribute to the Gideon ministry, I'd encourage you to do that. They do a marvelous work. We have many of our men and women in our church who are involved in Gideon work, and uh, it, uh, it, it's a great work. So glad to get to uh, be away and have things taken care of so well there. And uh, one other thing I want to mention before we get into this, this Wednesday night I'm going to start a, a study that has been on my mind and then I started I had two or three conversations with people about the need for something for new Christians or young Christians or people who just kind of need a refresher on the, the, the fundamentals of the Christian life and I don't know that you'd ever outgrow the need to sometimes return to that and so we're going to do a deal starting this Wednesday night called Living in Christ and you'll get a copy of this little book and uh, this is the book that Billy Graham Association sends to new believers. And they've been doing it so well for so long. Why and reinvent the wheel? I mean, we're just going to use this uh, uh, about eight sessions on Wednesday night in the chapel right here. So uh, I would encourage you, don't think this is just for new Christians. This is for anybody that, that needs just some of the fundamentals of of the Christian life, and then, you know, this is kind of the milk of the Word. You don't want to stay there, but every once in a while it's good to go back and get a, a drink of milk. It may be that right now that's where you are. You feel like when you go to a 
Bible study or whatever else you kind of feel like I do when I go to an audit committee meeting. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't even understand the language, you know. I mean, think of, you know, if somebody were to ask you to turn to Galatians, you'd, you know, you'd turn to the index. That's okay. And, and, and I, want, I want you to feel comfortable sitting in places where, uh, in, 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 where the Bible's being taught. And so maybe this will help. And so come on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. And we got a, we got a meal at 5. You can come for that. Or just come at 6. You'll get a copy of this. Or, or maybe you know somebody. They're a new believer or a young believer. Or maybe they're just kind of kind of getting restarted in it. And uh, this would be a really good way to do that. And so we're going to start offering this on a regular basis. Uh, this time it's going to be on Wednesday night. We'll probably offer it when it's on Sunday morning and, and other times so that p- different people can be a part of it. But this is something that the staff and have talked about and we're just we're going to do that we're going to use this tool and uh, that'll be Wednesday night at six um, and I'd encourage you to come be a part of that now Acts chapter 14 Acts chapter 14 I want to read the first seven verses of Acts 14 It came about that in Iconium, that's a city that we're going to be looking at for a while, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a great multitude believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. Therefore, they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and some sided with the Jews, and some sided with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Laconia, Lystra, and Derbe, and the surrounding region. And there they continued to preach the gospel. call this persuasive preaching and I don't know what your interpretation or definition rather of that phrase or how you would what is persuasive preaching what does it look like what happens when it occurs in this case it it seems to be a pretty clear uh, look at what what persuasive preaching is it, 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 it says there, they spoke in such a manner. They were, they were preaching. Verse 7 uses the word preach. They continued to preach the gospel. So what they were doing was preaching. And it was persuasive. Now what, what happens when there is persuasive preaching? The first thing that we see here, according to Luke is that the message was received the message was received that i just have to back up and say as we're going to talk about a little bit that it's rejected by some in this case it's received but not even every time it's persuasive is it even received but in this case it was the 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 test of preaching and and true preaching is not what people do with it it is it is as i've said before i've got a little uh, deal that judy had fixed up for me that i read about jonathan edwards and he said true preaching is faithful accurate intense vivid and loving faithful accurate intense vivid and loving that doesn't say anything about what people do with it. So if you get into the area of, of speaking, teaching, preaching, don't gauge how well 
the preaching was simply based on what people did with it. Jesus preached and they tried to run him off a cliff. In this case, the message was received. It says in verse 1 that a great multitude believed. They were in Iconium. The reason they're in Iconium is because they had been in a place called uh, Antioch of Pisidia. There's an Antioch of Syria, and you hear some of that talk about today. This was an Antioch in another part over in what we know now as Turkey, and they moved from there. They, they, verse uh, 51 of the previous chapter says they shook the dust from their feet, which is what the Lord told them to do when they were rejected, and left that town and went to this city of Iconium, in what we know, if you're looking at a map, current map, it would be Turkey. In this day, there were, it was Asia Minor, and it was all broken up into regions, but it's in the area that we know now as Turkey, and they went into the synagogue, which was what Paul did. He went into the, the synagogue, was the buzz of activity. We saw a few on our trip, uh, you know, not necessarily the building that was there at this time, but built upon that area, and and generations of Jews begin continue to have synagogues. The word synagogue means gathering. And, and it started in the Old Testament where they had the temple destroyed, they were scattered, they were exiled, and while they were in exile, they began to gather. They didn't have a temple. They gathered, and those gatherings were called synagogues. And they continued that practice even when they came back. So if they lived in a town uh, away from Jerusalem, they would have a synagogue, and they had enough... Uh, men, Jewish men that constituted uh, having a synagogue, they could build a synagogue and that's where they would gather. It's a buzz of activity. And not just Jews, the Gentiles would go. Gentiles who wanted to follow Jehovah God. God-fearers, we've learned about them. And they, they, they were attracted to this idea of one God. See, the pagans worshipped many. They were polytheistic. They, were, they had the more the merrier. And, and all of a sudden this this nation of people came worshiping one God and there were Gentiles who were attracted to that and, and were, were trying to find out more about it and they would come and they would gather in the synagogues and so Paul could go to the synagogues and he could preach to, to Jews who were his kinsmen in, in, in the flesh and he could preach to Gentiles and that's what he's doing. And it says that he spoke in such a manner that a multitude both Jews and Greeks, or Gentiles, or non-Jews, believed. What does it mean they believed? Well, we've talked about that word, because it's, it, it's, it, it can be a little confusing, because there's a man named Simon, the magician, not Simon Peter, but remember there was a man named Simon who was a magician, and it says that he believed and was baptized, and then tried to buy the Holy Spirit from the, the apostles. I mean, what did he believe? Well, he, he believed, and uh, he, he mentally agreed with what they were saying. But he was so convoluted in what he believed about it, that he thought he could buy the power of the Holy Spirit and use it for his own purposes. He was a magician. He was there to wow people with, with show. He wanted to do the same thing, be able to bestow the Holy Spirit. What was his belief? His belief was really in himself. And he wanted to use the Christian message as a means of satisfying his own pagan thinking. That was, that was a belief that was convoluted. What is saving belief? It is laying your faith and trust on Jesus Christ. Um, you can believe that a chair will hold you up, but if you never sit in it, it your belief is, is empty. Faith without works, James tells us, is dead. So I believe in Christ, and I place my life in His hands. That's what that belief is. By, in contrast, we're going to meet some people who did not believe that. These people believed, trusted Christ alone for salvation. The preaching was so persuasive. Now I want to stop a minute and talk about that. That kind of preaching. Paul wrote a letter called 1 Corinthians to the church at Corinth. He wrote two letters to them. This is the first one. And right off at the beginning, he talks about the kind of preaching that he did to them. Now listen to what he says. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 2. When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, 
de- proclaiming to you the testimony of God. Why would he say that? Because the Greek mind was all enamored by oratory skill. We visited some of the, the theaters that they uncovered and one of them in Caesarea that, that, that looks out into the Mediterranean and they would and they they would have their their you know their plays and their other things there, but they would also have great orators. The Greeks loved to do that and they, they loved to show off their oratory skill. And not only that, they loved to wow people with strange ideas. And the stranger the better. And so it, there was this contest that would go on a lot with these guys of who could come up with the strangest uh, philosophy or idea, and they would come and they would try to wow people with it. Now, Paul says to the Corinthians, I didn't come to you showing off some kind of oratory skill or trying to wow you with my, with my new idea that nobody had ever thought about. He said, I didn't come to you with that. Well, how did he come to them? Verse 2, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, let me ask you something. Where's the resurrection in that? Does that mean he didn't, be, he didn't preach the resurrection to them? No, he did. Matter of fact, chapter 15 of the same book is one of the most exhaustive chapters and sections about the resurrection in any of Paul's writings. But what he said to them was this. I I determined that the biggest need you had was to understand that there is one sacrifice for sin, and that's Jesus Christ. See, Paul knew his audience. He, He knew, he understood by God's wisdom the kind of people, and that, we talked about that in a message a long time ago about being able to c- connect with, with the people that you're preaching to, and, and he, he would do that. Peter would do it. And he said, I, I determined that the biggest need for you was to understand that there is one sacrifice for sin, and that's Jesus Christ. See, they were, they were, all, they were confused about it because there were Jews who were t- t- telling them something else. No, you, you can't just trust Jesus. You've got to become a Jew also. You can't, I mean, Jesus is fine, but you've got to become a Jew, then you can come, become a Christian. That's what they were being told. And he said, I determined that you were, you were being so confused about it that I needed to, to proclaim to you clearly that there is one sacrifice for sin, and that's Jesus Christ. Then he said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in trembling. Paul, the apostle, apostle, weak, fearful, trembling. That's not exactly the picture I've got, do you? I mean, any, anything that, if you've got any familiarity with the apostle Paul, I mean, you've got this kind of type A guy who just walked through a wall. He was, he was so, so groomed to be a, a Jewish uh, star that when he was a little boy, they, they, they sent him to Jerusalem, and he was tutored by the greatest Jewish mind of his day, a guy named Gamaliel. Here, here's the Apostle Paul, that when he was lost, he was going into people's towns and homes and dragging Christians out and arresting them and had some of them put to death, splitting up homes. Matter of fact, Luke says one place, he was breathing out rage, fire, this guy preaching with weakness and fear and trembling? Are you kidding me? That's not the picture I've got of Paul. But something had changed. He became aware of the gravity of what he was doing and the stakes. The, the, what, was, what was at stake? What's at stake? The eternal destiny of people's souls. We're not just trying to change people's minds so they can have a better marriage. We're not just trying to help people out to figure out the best way to, ha- to handle their finances. We're preaching to people the, 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 the consequences eternally of rejecting Christ. And on a positive side, the eternal beauty of coming to Him. 
What, what are the consequences? And I think that, that the Apostle Paul, it, 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 would, it would fill him up in, in a sense of saying, what, what happens when people reject this? What am I getting to do? What am I getting to proclaim? And I'm telling you, uh, I don't want to ever lose that. I don't want it to paralyze me. I don't want it to paralyze me. I, 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 want, uh, I read this week uh, one of my favorite commentators, Campbell Morgan, and he says, you know, you, you do this not letting it control you, but you, you, you let the fear and the weakness and the trembling of the consequences be grabbed by the Holy Spirit. And you, but you, I never want to lose the sense of what's at stake. This is not just a human thing. It's not a temporary thing. It's not just a worldly thing. It's not just making your life better down here. So I, I fear that some people get the idea because we do try to help people with marriages and parenting and finances and, and recovery from addictions and other things like that, that, that the Christian message is all about cleaning your life up down here or helping you through the struggles of this life. And while that happens on the way, the greatest consequence is that you would die without Christ and spend an eternity without Him. And the gravity of that needs to be kept in the mind of the preacher. He said, I, in verse 4, my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit. Like the Lord said to a guy named Zerubbabel in the Old Testament. He was the guy that was going to help come back, bring the people back and rebuild the temple. And he said that, you've heard this verse, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. And he was saying to that guy, you will not build this because you're a good builder or because you're a good leader or because you're a good organizer. I will use those things, but don't trust that. Whatever you have in your hand, like Moses, throw that stick down and pick it back up and it'll be, be mine. Whatever you have, offer it to him. Personality, abilities, skills, those are great. Those are wonderful. Those are God-given. But don't depend on those. Because about the time you do, you're going to be called to do it fully, fully, absolutely having to trust in the strength that God gives. That your faith, verse 5, that your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men. You know why Paul said he did this? He said, because I do not want you to fall in love with me. I do not want you to fall in love with my skill. I do not want you to place your faith in how well I preach and how well I study the Bible and how well I proclaim the truth and how well I organize it and how well I do not want you. And if you do, you have fallen in love and put your trust in the wrong person. And if somebody out there is demanding that you do that, you reject them like you would a snake in your house. We are not calling people to follow us. And sometimes when somebody gets real good at what they do on a human level and they've done it a long time and they've gotten a lot of people buying their stuff and coming to their places and doing that kind of stuff and all of a sudden this guy begins to b believe his press releases and all of a sudden it's all about you falling in love with me and you trusting. And Paul says, this is the Apostle Paul, the last verse I read, that your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men. And he said, if I have to be weak, and if I have to be fearful, and if I have to be trembling, if I have to absolutely lose the abilities that I had as a lost Jew, then so be it, because I don't want you to trust, put your trust in me. And later on in that in book of Corinthians, he had to chide them because they were picking preachers. He said, some of you have fallen in love with Cephas. That's another word for Peter. And some of you have fallen in love with Apollos. He was a, he was a young, uh, flaming, uh, great orator that actually had to be taught the rest of the gospel because he was preaching well, but he was preaching incompletely. And some of them fall in love with Paul. And he said, let me tell you something. Don't fall in love with preachers. We do that too much. I, I, I'm not chiding you. I'm saying there are people in my life that I, 
that, that I learned so much from, that I was, that I was groomed under, that I, helped me prepare, and all these other things. And, and, and boy, if you're not careful, you, all of a sudden you've got so many of their books, and some get so many of their notebooks, and, and we used to have CDs, and <laughs> now we've got whatever you got. And cassettes, man, I got box loads of cassettes back here. I can't get rid of. But we can't fall in love with the preacher. Don't do that. God sometimes takes them away. Then what happens? That's, that's the persuasive preaching. Those first five verses of, of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 2 may be some of the most important verses for this preacher to hear. The message received. Oh, you know, we, we love it when it's received. We do. Love hearing stories of, of places where I read just when I got in this weekend, the revival that broke out at First Baptist Ada a week or two ago, and the preaching of Ken Freeman. And I, I, I know Ken, and, I, and he's a great preacher of the gospel, and he preaches uh, uncompromising. And, and I, amen and hallelujah, and God keep doing it. But I'll tell you, that preacher I, I know and some others that I know can preach that way and they're, they are not enamored by their numbers. They know it is the power of God in my weakness doing what he's doing. And at the same time people were coming to Christ, I'll tell you, more people rejected the gospel that week than received it. That doesn't always make the paper. But it's the truth. Jesus said it's a narrow road. It's a narrow gate. And, the, and the, the, the road of rejectors is wide and broad, and more people rejected the gospel that week than accepted it. We love the stories of, of, of people coming to Christ. But there was also the message rejected when this persuasive preaching happened. As a matter of fact, it was so persuasive that he persuaded some people to reject it. Now, does that sound like double talk? No, because when you preach the way it ought to be preached, you're going to draw a line and people are going to know what they're called to do. This uncertain uh, uh, you know, horn that's blown out to some people is... Everything's okay. Everybody's okay. You don't have anything to decide. Just keep doing what you're doing. That is not the gospel. The gospel preaches a clear tone of saying, here is what I'm inviting you to do because here's what God is inviting you to do. Take it or leave it. And those that take it are believing. Those that leave it are not. And so with that comes the message rejected. Verse 2, back to Acts. Back to Acts. The Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. They did not just not believe the gospel. They wanted to shut it up. They wanted to shut it down. It was not, well, no, thank you. Whatever is good for you is fine. Go do what you do. God bless you. Whatever. You know, I've had those people in my life. No, I'm not interested, but keep doing what you're doing. You're going to do somebody some good. That wasn't these people. They did not only not believe, they wanted to shut it down. Paul preached, and the, the very people that were his heartbeat of, of kinsmen, Jews, and for that matter, God's people. Can you, can you believe, imagine rather, the, the heartbreak of our Lord of the people that he raised up through Abraham to be a blessing to the nations and, and told them, I'm going to pass a Messiah through you. And for thousands of years, he prophesied through his prophets that the Messiah would come through Israel. And all these amazing things that God did to preserve Israel when the whole world, it seems, 
we're out to destroy them. We went to the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, and you just can't imagine another reminder of the, the, the hatred of our enemy, Satan, against Israel and how he uses people. It started back in the Old Testament. Remember the story of Esther and how Haman was going to destroy the Jews, and Esther was raised up, and, and their celebration that we were in Israel during Purim. It's, 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 the, it's the celebration of what happened when Esther said, if I perish, I perish. And she went to the king to preserve the Jewish people. And that passed on through history. And now today, Israel is surrounded by nations that, that all they, they wish they could figure out some way of just pushing a button and Israel would be exploded into oblivion. With all of that happening and God pours out his protection to even of a remnant. And these people are rejecting it. I sat at the wailing wall the other day and just, and just your heart breaks for these people. Uh, they, they, they are so passionate about what they do, but they are so passionately wrong. Their eyes are blinded. The, their Savior came to them. Their Messiah came to them, and, and they rejected Him and are still doing it today. That's why when you find somebody like we had here a year ago, Zev Nevo, who is a a messianic Jew, you find somebody like that and their eyes are just, their eyes are open and they realize everything I've ever learned in the Old Testament pointed to Jesus Christ. And here was Paul preaching and, and, and a multitude of Jews and Greeks believed, but then the reality that yes, there may be more rejecting it than accepting it. So what'd they do? Well, they didn't face up to Paul. They took the cowards away. These weren't people that wanted, listen, these weren't people who wanted to know the truth. They wanted to get rid of the messenger. There's one thing when somebody says, I don't like what you say, I don't agree with it, but I want to find out more. They've got the honesty and, and, and the integrity to say, tell me more. Tell me more. I want to know more. I want to, if, 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 if you say that that's true, I want to know. And they, they, they will come and they will talk with you. That wasn't these people. They didn't want to know the truth, and they wouldn't face up to Paul. So what they do? They went to Gentiles who were all too willing, some of them, to, to be tools in their hands, and they embittered them against Paul and his companions. They just begin this whispering campaign, and, and all of a sudden... There's this wave, and as a result, what happened? The city, it says, verse 4, the multitude of the city was divided. Pre persuasive preaching doesn't always unite. As a matter of fact, it may never truly unite. Because that's not the objective in terms of a city and whatever else. It's the objective of a church. Jesus prayed that they may be one. But the world will never be united other than around Jesus Christ. Goodness sakes, my goodness, we're just going to stand around and hold hands and hum and sing Kumbaya and everything's going to be okay because we want it to be, not without Jesus Christ. Remember what I said when the, the message before I left? and it, A message called Divided. How, how was the city divided in that case? Free or not free? Forgiven or not forgiven, heeding or neglecting, begging for more, wasting what they had, joyful or jealous, appointed to life, heading for death, Holy Spirit filled or hate filled. They were divided. Persuasive preaching divides. People who've come to Christ and have divided their home. Jesus said it would happen. So they attempted to stone them. An attempt was made, verse 5, by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and stone them. They had to have the rulers because a ruler of some sort had to approve the stoning. That the only mode of execution the Jews allowed was stoning. They, they, when Jesus was crucified, they could have come up with some trumped-up thing to stone him. It just didn't fulfill. It just didn't fit into prophecy. He was going to be hung on a tree. And so they, 
they got some rabbi or somebody to approve it. And see, Paul had been that guy. Do you remember the story we talked about many months ago of Stephen being stoned? And they laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. This was pre-conversion Paul. Saul, because he was the guy on site that could give his approval to stone Stephen to death. And he did. He gave approval. Now, it's turned, and another religious ruler has given approval to stone him. It doesn't, didn't happen, but it will happen. Same chapter, verse 19, the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. Paul and his companions left and went to Lystra, and while they're in Lystra, the guys from the last city that tried to stone him and he got out of town came to Lystra with the guys from the other town, and they came together in verse 19, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Sometimes it succeeds, sometimes it doesn't. It's all in God's economy. But here it doesn't. What's the point here? Persuasive preaching is received and rejected. It is. And while we rejoice in those receiving it, we can't lose the reality that probably more reject it in a, in a big service or whatever. 3,000 at Pentecost believed and, and, and received Jesus Christ and were baptized. That's wonderful. Well, there were probably 100,000 people, if not more, in the city that day. The messengers rejected. But last of all, the messenger's response. How is a persuading and persuasive preacher to respond when... His preaching is received and rejected. Well, it says, verse 3, therefore, and I've hopefully got you to, when you see a therefore, see what that therefore is there for. Verse 1 told us what? Persuasive preaching, the message received. Verse 2 says what? Persuasive preaching, the message rejected. So what do you do with that? Therefore, they spent a long time there speaking boldly. Not because of what anybody coming to Christ, because there were. Not because everybody was rejecting it, because not everybody was. They were speaking boldly. Now, what is bold preaching? Is it simply volume? I mean, I can yell, scream, and holler, Mary had a little lamb. So what life-changing message did I just give you? Is volume the test for boldness? Is just rudeness? I mean, some people equate rudeness with boldness. Rudeness is just rudeness. And sometimes we need to have a little kindness and mixed into our witness so that we're not just rude rudeness is no there's no premium on rudeness per se boldness there may come across sometimes as being rude but just to be rude doesn't mean you're bold just to be loud doesn't mean you're bold just to hammer your fist on on the podium doesn't mean you're bold what does bold mean it means that you're not compromising in what you say one of the boldest messages I ever heard was one of the meekest people that ever walked this earth. Her name was Mother Teresa. And she stood in front of former President Obama and chided him for supporting abortion. Praise God for boldness like that coming out of the meekest little lady that walked the face of the earth. See, meek, uh, boldness is not volume. It's not rudeness. 
It's what you say, what you're willing to say in the midst of probable opposition. Speaking boldly, relying on the Lord. Camel Morgan says the true preacher says the thing that seems to have no force in it, which carries no conviction merely as a result of his eloquence or his argument, but when he says it, it becomes fire and a searching and a burning because the Holy Spirit catches it up and bears it upon the inner consciousness of men. Dear God, I cannot change anybody's life. I can't even change your mind. Truly, you may agree with me just to shut me up. That would change your mind. I can't change your mind, let alone for your life. That's not my job. That's not any preacher's job. To proclaim, as Jonathan Edwards says, faithfully, accurately, intensely, vividly, lovingly, Faithfully, accurately, intensely, vividly, lovingly. Faithfully, accurately, intensely, vividly, lovingly. Every Sunday, every week, that's my prayer. That I, I don't know what's going to happen. I want people's lives to be changed. I want people to respond. But I know that in their response there's rejection. But I want to be faithful, accurate, intense, vivid, and lovingly, and loving. And let God do what he does as he chooses to. Rely on the Lord. I was having a conversation this morning with one of my favorite encouragers, Phyllis Elrod. She stopped me out here and asked. They, they, she traveled to the Holy Lands before and knows about that. And we had a little snafu coming home. We were supposed to get home at 3 Friday afternoon. We got up into the airport at midnight because we missed our flight in Frankfurt and had to be divided up, and it was a mess. And, but we got here and, uh, you know, got got here about two o'clock got to bed about three and i just said you know but at least i said at least it was friday and not saturday and she looked at me she said brother james you would have done the same thing you do every sunday you would have relied on the lord and and she, that, she wasn't saying that as some kind of compliment she was just reminding me it doesn't matter if it's friday or saturday that you come in at three or get to bed at three you're going to rely on the lord and it doesn't matter if you're coming in from Israel or had a full day of rest on Saturday. You still rely on the Lord. It doesn't matter the circumstances. You prepare. You plan. You prepare. You pray. You get the rest you need. And then you offer it to God and say, Lord, here, here's what I offer to you. But I can't change anybody's heart. You have to do that. Luke concludes by saying the Lord was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by the hands. Remember I told you the apostles were given unique powers to heal almost on demand, almost on command. They just had unusual, like Jesus did, he gave them powers to do that. And signs and wonders, take the word wonders. When, when you think of something, when you use the word wonder or wonderful, it means that something has amazed you. Well, what's amazing about it? Well, in this case, remember what Jesus did? They were amazed because he did something that had never been done in front of them. They were even amazed at his teaching because he was so full of authority. But they, when, when he healed a man that had been blind since birth, they were amazed because they knew the guy. They knew he had been It wasn't some fabricated, you know, do it with smoke and mirrors type thing. He, he was authentic, a man that had been lame for 38 years. I, we were at the Pool of Bethesda where the man who was lame for 38 years, and everybody knew that. A man who was dead, they were taking his body to the cemetery. Lazarus was dead four days. His body was already stinking. Authentic verified, supernatural, wonderful things. So the word wonderful means that something attracts me to what he did. And that's what they were given the power to do. But here's the other word, signs. 
A sign is something that tells you about something else. All right? You see a sign, and wherever you're going, 41 miles. Or a sign with a curve. Up ahead, up there, not here, but up there, is a curve. A sign is telling you about something else. And these wonderful things that Jesus did and that the apostles did were telling them about something else, meaning the Lord's sovereignty, His power behind what they were saying. They were attesting. He was attesting His word. This is from me. Here are these people. This is from me. Some of them still rejected it. Even with the signs and wonders. What are, the, what are those today? Well, I suspect in parts of this world where that have been so dark, where the gospel has not yet reached, that the, the Lord may be working in those places with verifiable miracles to give attestation to His Word. In Bible Belt America, I suspect that the greatest work that we're seeing in the attestation of God are changed lives. Not just changed body, not just a... A, a, a bone that's healed, but a heart that's replaced with a heart of flesh. It's still happening. The Lord is still bearing witness to His Word. So the disciples were continually filled. They continued to preach. The section above, we finished, they were continually filled with joy filled with the Holy Spirit, and they continued to preach persuasively. But remember, persuasive preaching divides. It is received. I pray it would be. I pray that if you've not yet turned your life, you may believe all this, you may even have friends who are Christians, you may even respect them, but you have not yet rested your life in the hands of Jesus Christ for your eternal salvation. Not just a better marriage, not just a better grip on your finances, not just freedom from some addiction, not just feeling better about how your day goes, but your eternal salvation. You've rested your life on Him. And if you haven't done that yet, I invite you to Jesus. We plead with you, we, we, we implore you, use the Bible's word, beg you, but I can't do it for you. Nothing that I can do can do it in your place. You have to choose Him. I pray you will. For the rest of us, we rely on the Lord. Do what you do. Do it well. Whatever you have in your hand to do, do it well. Because it's your gift of offering to the Lord. Personality, speaking ability, working with people, working with your hands, organizing people. Showing mercy, encouragement, words that help people through the hard times of life. Take these things and use them and, 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 and let God take them in His hands and use them. But never depend on them. Never, never. Never depend on your personality or your experience or your skill. You always depend on Him. Let's pray. Tempting. I think one of the temptations of growing older is to trust experience. To trust experience. Well, I've done this and I've done that. And I've been here and I've been that. And well, that's good. But that doesn't mean anything for the future if I don't trust God. Nothing. Nothing. I don't care what I've done in my life. It, it guarantees nothing of the future. And it sure doesn't guarantee it if I don't trust the Lord. But that's not just me. That's, that's you. There's some incredibly gifted people in our churches. Have so much. We, we all have something to offer. Every one of us do. Because the Lord has seen it so. You do something well, my friend. Listen to me. Hear me again. You do something well, every one of you.
The Lord has designed that you do something well. And you ought to offer that open-handed to him. Whatever it is. But don't ever trust in that for spiritual success. You trust in the God who will take that. And he'll use it. But he'll get the glory. Because it, he's the only one that deserves it. We're going to sing some more. And while we do, would you ponder what we've heard? Think about it. Do you not come to Christ? Why would you wait another day as if you assume you'll get another chance or you assume that you'll feel like doing it another day? That's a, that's a really dangerous attitude to have. Come to Christ. Today is the day of salvation. Father, use what we've said. Please use it in all of us. I certainly have been reminded of some things that I have trusted instead of you. Forgive me for that. One of the dangers of a life of experience around the things of God is we start thinking that we've got this thing down and we don't need to trust you anymore don't need a quiet time anymore don't need personal Bible study don't need personal worship don't need that I'm okay I, I, I've got it down I, oh my about that time the bottom falls out and, and you do that you allow it to happen out of your mercy so we won't become so arrogant so full of ourselves so self-righteous so self-absorbed Now, I don't know about the challenges these folks face, but I know the ones I do. There's a part of me that wants to be a man pleaser. Gauge my success by who agrees with me. Far greater preachers than me have been run out of town. Jesus, they tried to run him off a cliff in his own hometown. Was he persuasive? Of course he was. He was so persuasive, he persuaded them to run him off the cliff. Speak, Holy Spirit, to us. Let's sing and worship the Lord.
They tell us that Israel has about about 13 million people. Estimates are that there are 15,000 Jewish Christians in Israel, in the whole country. One day we got to go in downtown Jerusalem to one of those places. I asked our travel guy last year, I said, would you let us meet some Christians who are living so isolated but so passionate. So we went to a downtown 14-story building. We went up the elevator and got off. Wandered through a maze of office suites and opened the door. And some middle school students, 12, 13, or 14 years old, were doing this. <clears throat> and we just sat down. We weren't, we weren't, I said, we, we just want to bask in this. We just sat down and they just sang in their language in Hebrew worship, but you could just tell. Their leader. A lady named Sharona means Rose. She, uh, when we had to leave, she said, we want to pray for you. <laughs> pray for us. Yeah, because they were probably more equipped. They do what they do. Not with a whole bunch of other people coming and joining them. They and they prayed over us. Then the middle school kids left and the senior high guys came in and we're going to do the same thing for a senior high group. And they do that all day on Wednesday. <clears throat> well, sometimes you just got to get out of your comfort zone and see how the rest of the world lives. We're so used to coming to things and having people show up and but I'm telling you, Jesus is just is, is who he is to them. Our heart breaks. Will you pray for those believers over there? They so want to reach their kinsmen with the gospel. But it's so hard. So hard. My friend Zeev Nevo, who was here last year, has gotten reconnected with his elementary school classmates. And they found out that he was a believer in Christ. And he's had a, he was over there and we met and he said, my classmates, I was in the first, second, and third, and fourth grade with these people and now they're wanting to come and have coffee with me. I'm, he said, I'm 35 years old and finally somebody wants to hear about my faith. Ah, well, let's worship the Lord through offerings. Father, thank you for what you do. I love you. I love your people. I love your word. I trust you. I rely on you. I'm weak. I'm tempted to be a man pleaser. I'm tempted to look at external things for validation. I trust you. Thank you that you forgive and you restore and you have a gospel of grace for us to preach. In Jesus I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.